Hello, today we're going to be discussing financial management and investment and this will be part one. This is therefore an introduction to financial management and investment and at the beginning we need to realise that there are four different classes of financial asset and they are cash, stocks, bonds and commodities. So we will start by considering the theory and practice of investment, whether it is for corporate funds, company funds, or if you wish to become your own stockbroker, for example. So how can you manage investments? So we we'll start with the introduction to that. We need to bear in mind that there are several different types of business organisation, such as sole proprietor, partnership, limited liability partnership, private limited company, normally known as an LTD, and five, public limited company, normally known as a PLC. Each of these is a different type of business organisation and would need different funds to enable them to start up in business. Then they would need a throughput of financial capital once the business is up and running. Profit is achieved when the capital that is coming into a business is greater than the capital that is being paid out. Many companies decide upon a loan from a bank. If a bank shows confidence in a proposed business plan for an organisation and it decides to invest in that business, then it is investing into the assets of the business. And these are known as tangible assets such as machinery or factories, offices and intangible assets such as technical expertise, trademarks owned, uh, patents etc. The bank will of course expect to receive interest on the loan that it has provided. If the company exists for a long time then this, in this interest, this investment can be seen to become highly lucrative over time. However, it must be uh, remembered that while sole um, traders, sole proprietors and uh, partnerships are subject to unlimited liability uh, should they go into bankrupt. That the other three types of business that I just mentioned too, the limited liability partnership, the LTD and the PLC each have limited liability and so should they go into liquidation only have limited liability, uh, liability to pay back which is based upon their capitalization uh, or their recognized worth. This is primarily based upon the share capital that has been raised due to the issuing of shares uh, in the company over time. Therefore, another investment opportunity is to select good organisations that you believe will be increasingly successful and will not go bankrupt and arrange to buy shares in them if they are either an LCD or a PLC. For example, investors in shares in the Apple Corporation have seen spectacular gains between the years 2002 and 2011. So profits can be gained by one, buying shares at a low price and at some future stage selling them at a higher price. Two, uh, through the earning of dividend payments from the company to yourself during the time that you own these shares. In the UK, these dividend payments are twice a year, and in the USA, for example, the dividend payments are four times a year. It is important to remember that if an investment in a public limited company, a PLC, is to grow, then there must be a free and active market in the shares, that the buying and the selling of the shares must be actively encouraged, must actively occur on a regular, ongoing basis. If an organisation is investing some of the profits that it is earning, then it will usually have a financial officer or a chief financial officer. This person will work closely with the treasurer and the financial controller. The key role of the chief financial officer is to set the overall financial strategy for the organisation. This team of people must have a great understanding of the financial markets and the financial institutions and understand payment mechanisms, the borrowing and lending and also the pooling of risk. In the modern age, good managers are always looking to maximise the value of the firm. 
This is because they need to satisfy all of their stakeholders, if at all possible. A stakeholder is anyone with a financial interest in the firm and would include shareholders. Now we'll consider an introduction to accounting and finance, which I need to cover as part of this. Although I'm not covering an accounting or financial course, it is essential that I touch upon the key financial documents that an organisation needs to produce on a regular, ongoing basis to ascertain its current financial position. Number one is the balance sheet, which is a financial statement that shows the value of the firm's assets and liabilities at a particular point in time. This is to uh, enable the company to identify both the book values and the current market values of a company's assets. So the book value is based upon the net worth of the firm according to the balance sheet. However, the book values are based upon historical and uh, indeed possibly original values, whereas the market values are based on the current values of the company's assets and liabilities. <coughs> The second document is the income statement that will show the revenues and the expenses and the net income of the company. This over a period of time, usually the company's financial year. Uh, initially perhaps EBIT will be looked at, which is total earnings before interest and taxes, EBIT. This includes the total revenues minus the costs and minus depreciation. So, what is depreciation? Well, this takes into account the reduction in value of a company's assets over time. For example, machinery and possibly company cars. Once this figure for EBIT has been calculated, then both the interest charges and taxation have to be calculated and deducted from the original figure. Then, any agreed payments need to be paid to shareholders, together with any agreed amounts to be reinvested within the business. So the reinvested money could replace old machinery, it could extend the factory, it could be used to acquire another company, it could purchase ownership of a brand from another company, it could expand the research and development facilities of the organisation, it could possibly purchase uh, additional raw materials, invest in more component parts, hire additional staff, and possibly retain the uh, services of an expert in a particular field. So all of this should be good news for any current investor as it implies a confidence in the future of the business uh, and a concerted effort to expand the business so it becomes larger and is worth more in a year's time. Should this transpire, then the value of the investor's shares should have increased. So that is, I think, going to be good news for the investor. The third financial document is the statement of cash flows. This financial statement shows the firm's cash receipts and cash payments over a period of time, which again is usually a 12-month period. Of course, all profits which are made by the corporation are subject to taxation. The more a company makes in gross profits, the more it would have to pay the government in corporation tax. This is determined on a sliding scale and is altered over a period of time uh, based upon the occasion of the government uh, introducing its next financial budget. So, theoretically, multinational conglomerates would be expected to earn high profits and so pay higher percentages in corporation tax. However, this is not necessarily so. In reality, many of these large companies, these large conglomerates, do have their own company offices registered elsewhere in the world, uh, offshore as it's termed, and uh, safe in tax havens. And so, on this basis, they avoid paying tax or indeed only pay a small amount of tax. Element three, the time value of money. If you are planning to invest, it is important to recognize the value of money over time. So if you invest money now, what will the value of that money be in the future? Ideally, the amount of money you invest will grow in the future due to the fact it is earning interest. This can be number one, simple interest. That is the interest which is earned only on the original investment. Or two, compound interest. This is where the interest earned in the first year is added onto the original investment sum uh, and interest is then going to be paid in the, uh, the end of the following year on both uh, the original amount of money plus 
the interest for the first year. So what this means in effect is that your interest is now also an interest. However, it's important to remember the value can go down. I mentioned earlier that if you buy a good or a product such as a car, then its value is likely to go down over time. Its value is likely to depreciate. Companies do usually account for this and often totally write off the value of a company vehicle over time. This could be a company car, a company lorry, a company van, a delivery van perhaps. So, over a period of time, such as a five or ten year period, a company may decide to write off the value of a company vehicle over time. For example, if it were five years, uh, then it could be shown as follows in the uh, fixed assets column. Um, so only 80% of the original purchase price shown after the end of the first year, only 60% shown after the end of the second year, only 40% shown after the end of the third year, only 20% shown at the end of the fourth year, and 0% of the original purchase price at the end of the fifth year. So in effect its worth or its value would then have been written off over that period of time. However, the vehicle might still be roadworthy and be able to be used within the business for several more years without needing to be shown or included with any, within any future financial documents such as the current asset or fixed asset. However, in business there are exceptions to every rule. So on occasion, an asset can actually appreciate or increase in value over time. An example I'll give you is the one of the car, the E-Type Jaguar. This was partly due to the fact that not very many were produced in the first place, and so many of those people who wanted to buy one of those when they first came onto the market were unable to do so. But later on, they were able to buy this car, some years later, and they took the opportunity to buy at that later date at an inflated price, a higher price than the original price of the car when it was first introduced onto the market. Another example of this would be the company Unilever. They had their head office uh, at one time based at Blackfriars in London, and they were there for many years before they decided to move their premises to another building in London. They had assets there of the building itself, and desks, chairs, etc. And they decided to have all of their assets re-evaluated. To their great surprise, um, they found that several paintings, which had been purchased many years earlier, uh, were now being valued and it was found that they were now worth a great deal more than the purchase price that had originally uh, been used to buy those paintings. This new valuation, this higher valuation, did account, uh, take into account the rate of inflation as well uh, per annum over each of the years since they first owned the painting. The opinions of art experts on these paintings were such that their current worth far exceeded any inflation rates that occurred over that period of time. Then we need to consider opportunities to invest in bonds or stocks. A bond is a security that obliges the issuer of the bond to make specific payments to the bondholder. Bonds are usually perceived to be a relatively safe form of investment. In the UK many people invest their savings into government treasury bonds. And this may be for a specific time period, such as three years, or five years, or ten years. Also, they may agree to invest into bonds at a pre-agreed percentage yield to be paid out at the end of the time period, e.g. 6.5% uh, on £10,000 after the end of ten years. <coughs> or, they could agree to uh, be paid 1.5% above inflation, which is known as index-linked, uh, on, say, £3,000, at the end of three years. There are many terms to consider here, I'll just mention some of those. Net present value, that is the present value of cash flows whilst deducting the initial investment. Two, the rate of return, this is the total um, income received over a given period of time per pound invested. Three, capital rationing, the limit that is set on the amount of funds which are available for investment. Four, opportunity cost, the benefit or the cash flow which is uh, foregone or lost as a direct result of the decision to take an alternative course of action. Five, working capital. 
Calculating your current assets and then deducting your current liabilities will allow you to know the current amount of working capital that you have available to invest. And six, inflation. The rate at which prices as a whole are increasing. So, when you're in a position to invest, you need to introduce some project analysis. These activities help you to decide which projects are the most worthwhile to invest in. So one, you could do some sensitivity analysis which, in, uh, which uh, you can use to relate to possible areas of uncertainty. For example, you could attempt to predict the effects of changes either positive or negative on sales of the company's products and costs that the company uh, is incurring. So it can be general or it can be on a particular activity or a particular product or the company itself. And the effects of these changes which are likely to uh, affect the company's profitability over time. If you are comparing between two or more alternative areas in which to invest, this may help you to decide which one is most preferable to invest in. Then, two, you could utilise scenario analysis, which would enable you to look at different sets of combinations of variables. However, each set would need to be consistent. For example, one scenario which is entirely pessimistic and another scenario which is uh, seen entirely from a, an optimistic viewpoint. Or three, you could extend the use of this scenario analysis by introducing simulation analysis. The probabilities of each different uh, possible outcome actually being achieved. For example, different percentage rates of return from an investment project. However, whichever of these analyses we decide to consider, we must do a calculation based upon use of a break-even analysis. For example, this could be an analysis of the level of sales of a given product at a particular average selling price and at which point an organisation would then break even before beginning to make profit on the investment made. If it was felt that it would take three and a half years uh, for this break even to occur, you might decide to invest in that company. However, if it were estimated it would take five years, you might decide not to do so, as in your opinion that length of time would be far too long for your investment to be sitting there not earning profit. Another approach is to make use of decision trees where you can plot on a diagram a series of alternative sequential decisions and importantly their possible outcomes. This can lead you to decide to abandon certain options whilst retaining an interest in one or more of the other options. <coughs>